convinced from just what you said that there's a profound connection between Maximus and Carius, uh, in particular on his anthropology, which is very holistic. And we overuse the word holistic, but I really do think it's found in Maximus. So what I'm going to do in my talk today is uh, sort of update some things that I've done on Maximus in light of recent research on what's called training and perception. And the cognitive sciences, uh, it's very clear now that, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, that the, your perception can be cognitively penetrated. Which, what that means is, typically the way we think of perception is that it's non inferential, right? But there are case studies in which perception can be shot through with prior uh, antecedent beliefs and reasoning processes. Maximus is, does, doesn't say that quite in the way I've just said it, but I think it's in Maximus. So I'm gonna try to make the case that in Maximus, you have two modes of perception. Uh, indirect perception, which is to say you perceive God in and through other things like nature, scripture, uh, the Eucharist, and direct perception or immediate perception, which Maximus in Athelasium 60 lays out a really clear distinction between conceptual knowledge and authentic knowledge. And I'm going to hopefully try to make sense of that. The larger projects of ascetical theology and deification provide the backdrop for understanding why and how Maximus links spiritual perception with the integration of the self. So in other words, for Maximus, it's pretty clear that he's not just interested in uh, providing an account on perception, he's providing an account on perception in light of the projects of deification and ascetic formation. Undergirding this conception of spiritual perception is a vision of how one ought to be formed philosophically, as well as morally, liturgically, and theologically, and of the path that enables one to make progress towards fulfilling the end of human existence, which for Maximus is divine likeness. As Polycarp Sherwood points out, deification for Max Maximus is all about gnomic reform. That is, whether humans will deliberate or move in the direction of realizing fully the capacities of their nature. Andrew Louth, in a footnote to his translation, says, the deliberative aspect of the gnomic will is linked to, quote, the experience of accurate perception or vision. So for, for Louth, it seems that Sherwood, there's this really keen connection in Maximus between the will, the formation of the will, and perception. However, Maximus' account of perception, or spiritual perception, envisions a complementary relationship between human cognitive activity and the work of divine grace. Redirecting the self to its proper end, in other words, does not necessitate shutting down the natural faculties in order to activate the spiritual nor does it require the activity of a secret sense or a supplementary intellect to our own mind. And the first quotation, I wish it were a little, I'll give it, yeah, that'd be great, uh, be great. will make the point, and I'm going to read it, receiving, quote, the mind of Christ comes along not by any loss of our mental power, nor as a supplementary mind to ours, nor as essentially and personally passing over into our mind, but rather as illuminating the power of mind with its own quality and bringing the same energy to it. That's the quote, quotation number one. There's a longer one, uh, quotation number two, that just highlights again for Maximus the uh, integral relationship between grace and nature. I don't like that dichotomy, but that's the language he uses. So in other words, our physicality is not, uh, we don't need some additional spiritual power in order to uh, have our cognitive faculties work properly, okay? now. The relationship between the spiritual and the physical, as Marcus was talking about, that's an interesting question. I haven't really thought that through. I'm more interested in just the integration of what I would call the natural cognitive faculties and our proper end, which is the indication. <coughs> so proper function uh, is the language I'm going to use to describe in this next section from Maximus. He thinks spiritual formation largely is about getting our cognitive faculties to work as they were designed to work, <coughs> like they're out of sorts. So Max, Maximus envisions the spiritual life in three stages. This is not going to be practice, physici, and theologia. Those are three distinct stages of the spiritual life. However, fundamental to this threefold approach is the formation of an insatiable desire for deifying knowledge that outweighs and redirects competing desires. The focus here is not only on how these stages factor into the cultivation of a state of mind, or as I would put, positive orientation, that is, quote, receptive to the mystical knowledge of God, but also on how they enable one to make progress towards the proper end. So it's not simply enough to have the right disposition, 
The right disposition needs to lead you to the proper end. Okay, so it's not enough to will or desire the right thing. You have to also enact what you desire through these processes. So it's one thing for a student to say, I want to know P here or some, some proposition or some discipline and never go about learning how to do that, right? So for Maximus, it's one thing to will or desire the proper end, it's another to actually achieve it. And for him, back to your question, image and likeness is extraordinarily important for Maximus because we're all endowed with a potential to be divine like, but there's the actualization of the potential to be divine like. He actually has a quotation which is either from Aristotle or some other writer, it's not clear. So these stages that I've described, the three stages, the first one is ethici, which is basically the purification of our desire, or as he, or he, or as he puts it, it's the formation of a praiseworthy desire or a holy passion, It's the language he uses. That's the first stage. In other words, to clear away all the distractions and put yourself in a position with dispassion dis, dis or however you're, uh, uh, apathia or however you want to put that, where then you're capable of contemplating, uh, through nature, God's logoi, which are embedded in the very existence of nature, or, or of, the, of the self, right? And so for Maximus, this, this really comes down to the ability to perceive indirectly uh, the indicators of God's presence in and through other things. William also makes this distinction between indirect and direct perception, which I think is, is very clearly in Maximus. And then the last stage, which for Maximus, the Elogia, is a, uh, is, a, is, a, is, is a purely divine action in which God will make himself known, and there will be the, the language is para, which is having an immediate awareness or a direct awareness of the object of perception. And I think for Maximus, he likes to use the language of energies. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain that today. However, satisfying our longing for divine likeness requires the proper functioning of our cognitive powers in the right environment. It's important to add that condition. It's not simply to be floating around trying to figure out where God is. It's to be doing it in a very deliberate fashion with a deliberate set of practices and a deliberate set of processes that, in, in which we depend on others to guide us through that process. In this regard, God has given us, quote, a mode by which we make proper use of our natural powers. That's an ambiguum seven. And there are plenty of other places where he makes the same, uses the same language. Conversely, the propensity to act in a way that is, quote, contrary to nature results in the misuse of our cognitive powers. In fact, Maximus frames the redirection of the self in terms of the distinction between the natural and unnatural motion of the self. In terms of the natural, he understands motion as a, quote, natural power or passion that is impelled towards its proper end. So for Maximus, passion is not in intrinsically a bad thing, depending on in what sense you're using the term. <coughs> However, passion can also lead to the opposite, which is the disintegration of the self and the misappropriation of our cognitive faculties. In this sense, we will deviate from the natural motion of the self, which is embedded in the very nature of human existence. That's how he sets it up with the beginning and the end of human existence. The beginning is the end. Because the beginning and the end are both given by God. The middle and between the beginning and the end is well-being, which is the formation of ascetic virtue, the formation of virtue. So the natural motion of the self includes the proper employment of our cognitive natural faculties, not supernatural. But the future state of deification is graced or unconditioned in terms of its mode of coming to know God. It, quote, finds no faculty or capacity of any sort within nature that could, re that could receive it, end of quote. That is, it does not take place in accordance with the receptive capacity of our nature, end of quote. And that's from Ambiguum uh, 20, from Nick Constant's, uh, Maximus Constant's recent translation. Although deification is a future state that is outside of the bounds of our nature, that is, it's, it sounds very much like Aquinas in that respect, it nevertheless is an internal perfection of the active faculties of human nature. Which is to say that the way Maximus sets this up is if you take the three stages of human existence or spiritual life seriously, the first two are not the same as the third, but they are, there's continuity. And what I want to say in that respect is there is a, what I would call a kind of training in perception, that you learn how to decipher 
the presence or the indicators of God's presence in and, the in and through your natural capacities, in and through nature, in and through reading scripture, in and through the Eucharist. And the mystic Ode has wonderful illustrations to talk about the food of Christ that we're given through the uh, celebration of the Eucharist. So the cultivation then of the spiritual life is not simply a return to a pristine world, nor is it merely the basic functioning of our cognitive faculties. That is to say, we're just really smart, we have good, good vision, and good hearing. That's not enough. What has to be done now is those faculties have to be trained in light of this ascension that I think Marcus was pointing out. Quote, a pure intellect sees things correctly. A trained intelligence puts them in order. A keen hearing takes in what is said. To put it in contemporary terms, the mature functioning of the self depends on and makes use of the faculties, but the dispositions that are needed for high-level high functioning are not the faculties alone, but the epistemic skills and virtues that are built upon them. So uh, the point I want to make in this section is that it seems to me deification requires a kind of training in perception, but it's most likely an indirect kind of perception. If you told Maximus every day when you woke up you were getting a direct perception of the mind, I think he would be highly suspicious, partly because of the duplicity that's fundamental to human nature, fundamental in, insofar as humans, uh, in fact, he says self-love is the mother of all vices. Because when we sort of surround ourselves with our own perceptions, we're now blocking ourselves or holding ourselves away from what is in fact real. So in order to get aligned with the nature of what is real, we have to realign the self, which is the whole point of the reintegration of the self in the beginning of the paper that I mentioned. There's a quote, uh, I believe it's, let me see here, three. It's a fairly lengthy quote from the Mystagogia about Maximus's point for the whole spiritual world seems mystically imprinted on the whole sensible world in symbolic forms. For those who are capable of seeing this, which presumes what? There's a capacity that one has to cultivate or hone in order for that to be obvious because some people look at the same universe, the same world, and not see anything or not perceive anything. And so what Maximus seems to be presuming here is there's embedded in the world uh, Logoi, and it's up to us to realign ourselves, and certainly God is assisting us in the process. It's not just a pull up your bootstraps kind of project. This kind of trained perception requires, quote, divine perception with the undaunted eyes of the mind. It's in Mr. Godita also. A truly wise person through the abundance of virtue possesses a mind illumined by the divine light and thus can see what others do not see. And he has other illustrations on the Imago Dei that, it, that I'll, I'll read it. It's a quote uh, four. It is evident that every person who participates in virtue as a matter of habit unquestionably participates in God, the substance of virtues. To the inherent goodness of the image is added the likeness. And he quotes Genesis 126 acquired by the practice of virtue and the exercise of the will. The inclination to ascend and to see one's proper beginning was implanted in humans by nature. So in other words, God's endowed us with capacities, and now we have to make good on those capacities to see that we are fundamentally an integrated reality, and like, I guess, precarious, uh, uh, Maximus says this in Ambiguum 7 very clearly. Uh, it's very similar to Aquinas' hylomorphic view of the, of the soul and the body, which is there's no pre existing soul, there's no post, post existing soul without a body. It's a simultaneous union of the soul and the body in one person. So it would make, make sense that he would add some sort of extra category called the spiritual senses in the way that I think Origen does. Okay, perceiving God now. So all I've talked about is this indirect uh, perception, which is to see or perceive, and I, I guess I would not want to reduce perception to vision. I want perception to include a whole lot of things, sensing the divine you know, through introspection and, and a variety of things. Uh, but Maximus does use a case in the language of vision. So as we've seen, the self must be volitionally open and formed through virtuous and contemplative practices in order to share the divine life. 
the, quote, conceptually loaded practices in the first and second stages of the spiritual life aid the self in purging misguided desires in perceiving correctly wisdom, or the logoi, in nature, and in making progress, progress towards divine likeness. I'll, I'll be glad to clarify conceptually loaded practices in the Q&A. If you, you need clarification on that, uh, I'd be glad to do that. In this sense, human agents of deification are active insofar as they, quote, uh, the, the fifth quotation, have operative by nature a rational faculty for performing the virtues, and also a spiritual faculty unlimited in its potential, capable of receiving all knowledge, capable of transcending the nature of all created beings and known things, and even of leaving the ages of time behind it. That's the context in which he distinguishes two ages, and the age of deification and the age of the here and now. Yet Mac, Max Smith, okay, that you think, oh, that's really interesting, but then he makes a distinction in Actalasium 60 between what he calls relative knowledge or conceptual knowledge and authentic knowledge. And this is, this, this is the uh, quotation, should be six. It's not showing. Uh, yeah, it should. I don't have a PowerPoint, I'm sorry, but I'm a bit old fashioned here. So th this is what he says. This is, uh, and again, I'll spend the last part of the presentation trying to clarify what I think he's doing. The scriptural word knows of two kinds of knowledge. He didn't say beliefs said knowledge of divine things. On the one hand, there is a relative knowledge rooted only in reason and ideas and lacking in the kind of experiential perception of what one knows through active engagement. Such relative knowledge is what we use to order our affairs in our present life. On the other hand, there is truly authentic knowledge gained only by actual experience apart from reason and ideas, which provides a total perception of the known object through a participation by grace. And then I added just by rational knowledge of God, I mean the use of analogy of created beings in the intellectual contemplation of God. By perception, I mean the experience through participation of the supernatural goods. So what I think Maximus is saying here is the eschatological gift of participating in God is the consummation of our volitional and cognitive activities in the first and second stages of the spiritual life. One can obtain truths about God from the natural world, but they fall short, meaning they're not beyond our nature, of the kind of direct experience, era, or immediate perception, is thesis of God that Maximus describes in the third stage of the spiritual life. In other words, a person may come to believe God or know God apart from having any religious experience. Through analogies, through inferences, I don't know if that means he's doing natural theology, but I think he, it's possible through contemplation to come to some knowledge or awareness of God in and through an inferential process. But that's not enough because uh, for him, I think, having an experience of God is greater than having a concept or a depiction of the divine in and through some indirect uh, mode of uh, perception or indirect mode of coming to know the proposition. Okay, conclusion. Spiritual perception then involves, it seems to me, a training of our perceptual capacities through ascetic virtues, and Maximus doesn't have to be ascetic virtues, and learning to perceive clearly the nature of things through contemplative practices. The ultimate goal, however, is direct perception of God, and I think in this case he would say divine energies. Experiencing God in this more profound sense is not abrupt or uh, disruptive, it is something that should happen as a result of these antecedent practices and uh, processes. So I think for him, there, there is certainly a, dis, a distinction between these stages, but it's not like the discontinuity that we think of uh, the model that Paul was talking about in terms of perception theory. It's more conjunctive, it's not disjunctive. It's different. Maximus then seems to operate with the distinction between indirect and direct perception. And for all you Maximus fans, he doesn't use that exact language. I am. I'm reading this as an analytic philosopher, and I think that's a distinction that he, he seems to operate with. The former entails a kind of training and perception that is shaped by the cultivation of ascetic virtues. In this sense, a person learns to sense things divine in and through something else, as I've, I've indicated. The latter, however, entails immediate or direct perception or perceptual knowledge of God. Spiritual perception then is a matter of progression. That is a matter of, perhaps of ascension, a matter of progression from an 
indirect kind of perceiving to a direct kind of perceiving. As a result, the natural state of the intellect is movement towards divine likeness, which he, which he really painstakingly points out in Ambiguum 7 when he's correcting the originist assumption of movement. For Maximus, movement is fundamental to our proper telos. That's not the problem. The problem is we're either going to move in the right, the right direction or we're going to move away from that direction. Thank you.